Hello and welcome to Intro to Meteorology. This is Chapter 1, Monitoring the Weather. The driving question you can see there is what are some basic characteristics of the atmosphere and weather? First off, let's discuss the difference between weather and climate, two words we'll be using quite a bit throughout this course. Weather is the state of the atmosphere at some particular place and time. It is denoted by things like the current temperature, the wind speed, the wind direction, barometric pressure, and so on. Climate is the aggregate of weather conditions at some location over a period of time. And for normals, that period of time is 30 years. So we look at some weather variable like maximum temperature. And we look at the maximum high for every day over 30 years, average it together, and we can say this is the normal average high temperature for this area. So climate is a little longer duration than weather. This course falls under the geography department and geography is a geography is a discipline that borrows from many other disciplines as you can see from this figure here we are in the meteorology circle and in the geography sphere here in the center is what we call the names of these disciplines that we study in geography. So we call it climatology and geography, though you can't study climatology without understanding meteorology. So the two really go hand in hand. Same thing for these other disciplines. Um, a definition of what geography means, if you look at the ancient Greek word that it's derived from, would be something like earth description. Geography is the science that studies the lands, the features, the inhabitants, and the phenomena of the Earth. We break geography into two classic spheres, the blue one, which is human or cultural geography, and the green one, which is uh, Earth or physical geography. And You can see the overlapping disciplines in there, the nature and society interactions, the rural landscapes and sustainability, and then this red circle is geographic information science, or geographic information systems, as the discipline is known, that is a way to use software to um, map out things that you could see distributed over geography. So, for example, uh, weather maps you can create with geographic information systems, or you can map uh, populations of people, or really any phenomena. That you, can, that you have data for, you can map. Physical geography deals traditionally with these different spheres. So we are in the atmosphere. The study of meteorology deals with the atmosphere. The biosphere deals with life on Earth. The lithosphere is geomorphology and the, the rocky structure of the planet. And the hydrosphere deals with the water. All right, so for weather in this class, you'll need to start, if you're not already doing so, paying attention to the weather. So you can do this through the internet, on TV, if you have the weather channel, it might become your new favorite station. Um, or you can just watch the newscasts, they always have a little segment on the weather. There are weather radios and weather applications for your smartphones and devices. When we talk about weather, there's a couple of things that um, we'll just mention here, and these are topics that we'll go into much more detail over the course of this um, meteorology class. The first deal with pressure systems, and there's two types. We have high pressure systems, and we have low pressure systems. High pressure systems are sometimes called anticyclones, and low pressure systems are called cyclones. If you look at the characteristics of a high and a low pressure cell, first thing to notice is that there's no cutoff values. You can see in the center of this high pressure cell the value is 1024 millibars. So that's relatively high compared to whatever values are around it. Same thing for the low. There's no cutoff point. It's just a relatively low area of pressure compared to the surrounding areas. Winds flow in a particular direction with respect to these cells of high and low pressure. The wind always wants to go from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. But it can't do that directly for reasons we'll get into later in the course. So the circulation of winds around a high pressure cell, as you can see in this diagram, are clockwise and outwards. And then for the low, it's just the opposite. It's counterclockwise and inwards. 
fronts are the leading edge of a new air mass that comes into an area. So what's an air mass? Well, an air mass is a big mass of air that was developed over a region of the Earth. So, for example, here in the southwestern U.S., a lot of our weather systems come from the west, and the air masses responsible for them developed over the Pacific Ocean. So they have moisture. Uh, that air mass has moisture, and it may be warm air, it may be cool air, depending on where it formed in the ocean. And as that air mass makes its way to the east, because weather moves from west to east for the most part, there are exceptions, but that's the general rule, that air mass begins to move into the area. And when we feel it at the surface of the earth, we call that the front. So a warm front is warm air, air that's formed in a mass that was over some warm place, like it developed over a desert, for example. And as that warm air mass displaces the cooler air that was currently in the location, we have a front. So here, this red line represents the frontal boundary between warm air and cold air. Now, warm air always wants to rise up over cold air. So as it rises, we have clouds form. And we'll see if we're paying attention. The first signs of this approaching air mass would be these high, wispy clouds and then thicker clouds and maybe some rain and a change in wind direction and then we know that the front has passed through and we have a new air mass in the area. In this picture below we have a cold front. So cold air is moving from the west into the east to displace the warmer air. And as the cold air comes in contact with the warm air, the warm air wants to rise up over that cold air and with cold fronts it can do so very rapidly and so we have uh, the potential for severe weather, severe thunderstorms, maybe tornadoes, and other severe weather. When we describe the state of the atmosphere, we look at variables like the maximum and minimum temperature for a 24-hour period, the dew point, also known as the frost point. That's the temperature at which any water vapor that's in the air will condense out as dew or frost if it's freezing out. Relative humidity is a percentage value that looks at the amount of water vapor that's in air versus how much water vapor the air can hold at a particular temperature and pressure. We have precipitation amounts, air pressure, wind direction and speed, sky cover, which tells um, how much cloud cover there is in the sky. And if there is hazardous weather possible, uh, the National Weather Service may issue a weather watch. And if hazardous weather has been spotted or is imminent, then a weather warning will be issued. To help us keep an eye on the weather, we have satellites in the sky that were designed to read information useful for predicting weather. There are two basic types of satellites defined by their orbits. The first one is a geostationary satellite. Geostationary satellites are very high in the sky, 22,000 plus miles. And as the name implies, they are stationary over a point on the Earth. So as the Earth is rotating around its axis, the geostationary satellite is orbiting around the Earth at that same speed so that it's always directly overhead of some particular location. We call that location the subsatellite point. There are two geostationary orbits that we use for U.S. weather, and they are at latitudes, or excuse me, longitudes of 75 degrees west and 135 degrees west, which kind of spans uh, both sides of the lower 48. We also have polar orbiting satellites. These satellites are not geostationary, they are in orbit around the Earth in such a way that they cross the poles, hence their name polar orbiting. And you can see as the satellite orbits, it's swathing, it's taking a swath of imagery or whatever it's uh, reading, whether it's visible light or infrared light, it sees a path of the underlying Earth. These are much lower in the sky, about 500 to 600 miles high, and they pass over the same point on the Earth two times in a 24-hour period. So remember, the Earth is rotating underneath 
the satellite's orbit, so it gets a good look at the whole Earth over a period of time. The imagery that comes from these satellites may be in the visible spectrum. If it's daytime, then we can get these visible images like we see here that make it easy to see the clouds and the areas that are clear. We may also get infrared imagery. If there's an infrared sensor on the satellite, it can read the signature of the underlying Earth in the infrared spectrum. Infrared can be a little bit tricky. We're seeing the same thing, cloud cover. This is the same image taken at the same day and time as the previous image. And here we can see there's clouds that we didn't see in the previous image. So infrared can provide additional information that visible cannot. And infrared can be seen in day or night. It's not dependent on daylight to give an infrared image. We can also get water vapor satellite images, which give us a measure of how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. Again, same day and time, we see the cloud mass that we've seen in the previous two slides. Um, here's this other bank of clouds. And in addition, we see a lot of water vapor all across the U.S. in this dry area that reaches up into the storm. Down on the ground, we have radar and we can put together a composite image of the radar. We have Doppler radar and other types of radar that detect movement and make it possible to see these areas of precipitation. So again, same image, uh, or same day and time, I should say. We see the storm is producing heavy precipitation in these areas, and there's little bits of scattered precipitation throughout the west. Often you see the combination of the radar image on top of a satellite image. So we see the satellite image here, which is the infrared image, so we see the clouds, and we see the satellite, or excuse me, the radar showing where the precipitation is currently happening to give a nice composite. 